Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the 3DO Experience, the 3DO Retrospective Podcast, where we talk about all things 3DO, the company, and everything in between. I'm Bill, and this is Threk. How you doing, Threk? Oh, I'm hanging in there, buddy. How you doing? Ah, uh, you, you know, the same. It's, uh, <laughs> life, life sucks and then you die, you know, the old, uh, the old saying. <laughs> Was that Vince McMahon? Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> Maybe. It might have been. Who knows? Uh, but yeah, it's been... It's crazy. We, we record these on Tuesdays and it's always like this week's been a week and it's like it's only two days in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had actually a decent, uh, decently busy day at work today, which was which was nice considering it was, you know, the first of the month. So there was some stuff to do. So that's always good. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just uh, just hanging out and chilling right now, trying to. uh trying to manage my finances for a little bit just because i'm not sure how things are going to be these next couple of months but, yeah for sure um, I'm, I'm trying to manage those as well and that's you know it's their own problem yeah uh, i've been kind of on a not so much a hiatus from gaming because i'm still i'll still play every now and then but i've been kind of in like anime um mode for like the rest of the year because over on gnc we, we like to do our year-end tradition of ending the season with a big recap of all the shows we've watched so Basically, me, me and Matt have decided we don't want to be embarrassed by Alex again this year. <laughs> um, Alex, why Hamster. why would you be embarrassed by her? Because last year we did this uh, we did this thing. We had a a friend of the show Slade uh, join us, and him his list and Alex's list completely just decimated me and Matt's, and we were like, "Well, this is embarrassing." Oh, uh, and that like she watched way more than you guys. Oh did? yeah. Alex is an anime watching machine. Like she, I think she told me she's already watched like 70 shows this year. Couldn't even fathom that. I don't know how she does it. She like, she must just be able to multitask and just always have a show on or something. I mean, that's just how some people are, you know? So, I mean, her favorite anime is one piece. So she's really good at being invested. <laughs> she has to, yeah, she has to knock that shit out as best as she can. I mean, she's watched it multiple times, so, <laughs> you know. But uh, yeah, other than that, not a whole ton of gaming stuff. Just kind of yeah. trying to get through some uh, smaller stuff. I I, I've been, I have that itch to play a Tales game right now, so I'm, I've am i been meaning to boot up. See, see, me too. I've had that itch. And I think we'll eventually talk about one later, but I'm not going to start it now, considering I'm, you know, I'm going to be out of the state for a while. Like yeah. I'm gonna be kind of busy this month, so maybe in November I'll uh, I'll boot up a Tales game and we can start blasting through it. Yeah, yeah, I know the, exactly the one we've kind of mentioned in the past, but uh, oh yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, but right now I'm I'm still working through the Bioshock series. I am probably over halfway through Bioshock Infinite, so in case Dre is listening, I won't spoil anything, but. Oh boy, infinite. There's going to be a lot to talk about, so I look forward to it. So I'm gonna do that, and I will do Barry. Let's see. Some people have made have made sure to me to play the Barry. Let's see DLC, which I will. Hmm. Like I might as well get the whole Bioshock experience while I'm here. So nice. So yeah, that, that's just... yeah, that's about it as far as uh, I'm. I'm still playing a bit of AC Origins here and there when I need a break, and that's still that's a fun game. I, I like AC Origins. Nice. I think the only other game series I've been kind of getting the itch to replay is uh, I've been having that weird like I want to just play a, a visual novel and like I think like the best one to play when you just kind of want something casual is like Ace Attorney. Yeah, yeah. See, I'm just I'm at that point where it's like I want to play like a wee bass RPG, you know, mm -hmm. so who knows? I, who knows? Maybe when I when I go on this trip, I'll bring like my 3DS and pick a wee bass RPG and play one. Maybe maybe I'll play uh, Dragon Quest Six while I'm out because I'll probably have a lot of downtime. So it might be, actually be the perfect time to play Dragon Quest Six. Dragon Quest Six is. I was talking to Matt about this because I think he's getting ready to play that one as well. Uh, it's like it's like the weirdest one for me because it's like it's a gr it's a great RPG, but it's like weirdly like overshadowed by the fact that it had to follow four and five. Well, and Chrono Trigger. Because Chrono Trigger was around the same time, and I think some Chrono Trigger influence kind of seeps its way into DQ6. Because, yeah, because the ones I still haven't, like, beaten are 3, 6, 7, 9, and 10. 
those ones I haven't beaten, but I've, I've, I've put a little bit of time into just about all of them. So, but six is one that, you know, yeah, that I, that I need, I need to sit down and play it. Like I need to catch up on all these, on all these mainline fucks, you know? So yeah, six came out at a really stacked time for RPGs too. Cause like, I think yeah, it, that was was 90, right it was 95, wasn't it? 95. Uh, 95 sounds right because it was like right at the end of um super nintendo and like by then like it was right around when final fantasy 6 came out chrono yeah. trigger december uh, december 9th 1995 nice so that's when um, it came out yeah and, sure. and i and i know six is uh like considerably longer than four and five because they're both about 30 ish hours and i believe six kind of hovers around that 40 hour mark yeah so but, but again, I'll have probably a lot of downtime, so I'll probably start working on that one while I'm down there. I think even Fantasy Star Four was right around that time, at least in the U.S. Because yeah, um, it might have been yeah, and even Earthbound too. I, I know Earthbound is kind of like the odd liar of that set of games, but it was weirdly enough, Fantasy Star Four was out in late '93 in Japan, but February '95 here. Yeah, I know it came out late for us, um, which is still bizarre, but I. That is weird, yeah. Granted, like RPGs on the Genesis were kind of overlooked, but unfortunately, other than, yeah. Other than Shining Force, everyone remembers Shining Force fondly. That's because they're great. And yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Ninety five was Earthbound, yeah. So like, yeah, ninety five was kind of a stacked year for RPGs. Like, I think yeah, Crota Trigger was ninety five, uh, March eleventh, ninety five. I'm pretty sure Final Fantasy six was as well. It was either that or late ninety five. It was either that or late ninety four. It was October 11th, 94 in the States. So very close. I think Mario yeah. RPG was around then too. Mario RPG was 96. Not, yeah, it was a little so, after. So I, so I think it came out like right around the time the Super Nintendo came out. Or uh, then 64, I mean. I know it was that and like Donkey Kong Country 3 were like the two like really late um, yeah, Super Nintendo one, games. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the tail end boys, yeah. So Because I know... Uh, in a uh, Donkey Kong Country Three, you can visit Wrinkly Kong, and she's playing a uh, in sixty four. And occasionally, you'll hear like Mario sixty four music in the background. Oh, that's cute. That's cute. But yeah, Dragon Quest Six. Yeah, on how long to beat? All Styles has it like forty six and a half hours. So it's funny because that was Heartbeat's first Dragon Quest, and it was considerably longer. And then they were like, "Bitch, hold my beer." When they made seven, because <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, seven is long. Yeah, and seven had it was like a five six year gap. So, and I think in that time, you know, like the whole PlayStation generation went by. So I think they just got a little too ambitious with what seven could be, and that resulted in seven being like just way way too much. So that when they did the 3DS version, they were able to trim like forty hours out of it, and even then, it's still a little bit too long. Yeah. Cause it's crazy because it's like i think heartbeat only did three games they did six they did the four ps1 port and they did seven and then they went out of business shortly after seven because they they, all, they, they also did hard. they also did the remake of three for the super nintendo or for the super famicom gotcha so yeah good stuff from them and then level five took over and made eight and nine yeah it, isn't it crazy that dragon quest seven it came out like like the PS2 was already out, and still Dragon Quest Seven is the best-selling PlayStation One game in Japan. Oh, they love their Dragon Quest over there. Like, what the fuck, guys? It's, it's crazy too, because that's the last game to use, I believe, the Dragon Warrior name. It, over here, yeah, 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 and it's like, yeah, it sold like over four million units, and that made it the best-selling dragon the best-selling ps1 game in japan and then dragon quest 8 became the best-selling ps2 game in japan which is just insane to me dragon quest is like unreal over there it, it's weird how it's like dragon quest is like the big one then final fantasy and then shimigami tensei yeah which it feels like they're it, it that's seeping over here a little bit but it feels more like final fantasy persona dragon quest you know yeah, Dragon Quest is finally starting to get some recognition, but like, I think the Persona boom has kind of pushed the the, the Shin Megami Tensei stuff a little higher. Yeah, especially with like Metaphor coming out, and people seem really hype on that one. So, yeah. Oh, there's too many goddamn RPGs nowadays. It's ridiculous. 
I remember back in the day, I was I was always be like, I wish it was all RPGs, and now I'm like, what was I thinking? <laughs> I, I wish they were all short. If they all were shorter, it'd be fine. Like if they all were like twenty hour games, I could live with that. The yeah. problem is, so many of them are fifty plus hours. It's like, guys, calm down, please. Persona Five, fucking love that game, but holy fuck, I just I just don't know if I'll ever have the time to play it. I honestly just don't know unless. Unless somehow I get like a complete week to myself where I don't have to do a thing or worry about anything, and I say, you know what, in this week, I'm going to see how far I can get into Persona 5. But other than that, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. But, uh. but, ho- but hopefully I'll get Dragon Quest VI knocked out because I'll be excited to finally, to finally play that one. Uh, kind of a black sheep in the franchise, I think. Yeah, it's it's such a weird like game because I there's like no consistent opinions on it, not at all. So that's why I look forward to it. So, do you see a uh, Nintendo took down another emulator? Yeah, I mean, yeah, <laughs> it's like uh... it's, it's one of those things where I'm just like, it sucks, but it's Nintendo; they'll do it anyways. Yeah, and and that's the thing if. if if Nintendo wanted to fight them in court, they would find that like re 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 jinx Ryu jinx or whatever. Like they're not using any like copyrighted code or anything. Like they just did all the hard work themselves. Yeah. It, it's so. like, it's like the bleem situation. Only Sony really wanted bleem to die. <laughs> yeah. Well, and plus like most of these companies do not like these, like hobbyists who are doing this, like don't have the time or the money to deal with Nintendo, unfortunately. Yeah, because I, I feel like if one of them decided to actually like take them on and and win, and they probably would win, maybe it would actually change things. But I have I have no idea. Well, it's a lot of them are kind of scared to now because the bleem the whole bleem situation kind of like ruined it for a lot of them because bleem won every lawsuit; they just got sued into bankruptcy. Yeah. And that's probably what Nintendo would do. Most likely. Like, because all these companies can't, don't have enough money to keep basically doing frivolous lawsuits. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, Sony was like hilarious with the, the emulators. They, they sued Bleem into oblivion. And then the Connectix workstation, they couldn't sue them because legally they were in the right in every way. So instead, they just bought them out and canceled it. Because <laughs> <laughs> why not? Ugh disgusting there's oh, rumors man. that they used a lot of the connectix technology in uh the psp and how they got ps1 games to run on it that doesn't surprise me i mean they own the rights they own the rights to it so why not exactly exactly so yeah the whole thing sucks it's, it's dog shit but you know unfortunately there's nothing we can do about it so nintendo's gonna nintendo exactly still waiting on that switch 2 news i, I have a bad feeling they're going to announce the switch 2 while i'm out I have a feeling that's when it's going to happen. Did so anything ever so happen with the uh, Pal World stuff? Or the, that is that already like no one cares anymore? My, my guess is they're probably like doing the part that nobody cares about, which is like the actual like litigation stuff. Yeah. So they're, they're probably doing like the trenches stuff. So I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about it at the moment. So though I did see an article today that apparently um, uh, Naoki Yoshida has said that he wants to release Final Fantasy 16 on Xbox. So he's like, we want to. It's just a matter. It's just we got to figure it out. Yeah, I, so. they, I think it's his whole thing is like he's a lot. He's looking at the PC sales and he's like probably confused because the it, the game kind of just well, a they shadow dropped it, which that never does well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They didn't hype it up at all. So I don't know. Maybe they're working out some marketing deal with Xbox so that they can make it a big deal when it happens. Yeah, which I think it's, is the way to go. And and I'll probably get it. I'll probably buy I, it. I just hope they don't get their expectations too high because I'm sure it'll sell decently on Xbox, but it's not going to be what they're expecting. Yeah, I mean it'll sell just fine. You know? Yeah, I just it'll be, it'll, it'll be curious to see what like you know metaphor sells because like the main marketing push for that has been the Xbox version, so it'll be curious to see how those sales do. It's interesting because they've been pushing it on Xbox, but like you know for a fact, all the Sony owners already were probably going to buy it anyways. Yeah, I mean, yeah, let's. I'm sure Atlas doesn't care. No, it's one of those things where it's actually kind of smart marketing because Atlas knows all the Sony people are going to buy it. So why bother pushing it on the PlayStation console? Yeah, when they should push it on there because there are people who own an Xbox who who like JRPGs 
and, and once you play them on there so yeah and atlas tends to have at least like good logic when it comes to expectations because like I, oh, they yeah. know they know that it's probably not going to sell as well on xbox but that's just there's less well, rpg fans on xbox than playstation yeah well and i think they like they didn't let persona 5's runaway success get to their head as well you know because well, then game, they because that game they, has sold uh, incredibly well and when it went multi-plat it sold it sold even more you know like, right well yeah when they put like persona 4 on pc and it sold fucking massively they were kind of like oh okay <laughs> and, and and then they're like fuck it let's put it let's put three four and five on everything and everyone was happy because now it's a multi-plat franchise and i'm sure it's gotten even more sales than it ever would have had so that says to me persona 6 whenever that comes it will be multi-plat day one probably most likely i don't see why it wouldn't at this point so or they'll throw some curveball and it, it's on like the fucking like some tablet thing and it's like here <laughs> i mean i mean it's possible that sony could try to push like to to pay uh like sega a lot of money to try to keep persona 6 like exclusive for a little bit but i have a feeling sega's like nah I don't even think yeah. Sony would because Sony knows the majority of their players are going to buy it regardless. So it's like, yeah, I don't know, unless they just want to be, you know, weird about it. But I don't think it'll matter. So I have Persona 5 on the series. So I did the thing. I bought a physical copy of it. It's I believe it's a European copy. It might be. Does it say Peggy on it? No, it has. I think it's European, yeah, but it, no, it, it has this on it. Oh, it's got the that other. Yeah, which, I mean, looks better than the Peggy, I think. But I think Peggy's, like, exclusively for Britain. Yeah, I think so. This is probably, like, well, it says Peggy 16 on the disc. Yeah, it's so, probably just one of those, like. So, MA15, it could just be, like, let's see. Doesn't say specifically. But not that it matters, but still. I, I bought it. I did my due diligence, okay? Hmm. So fuck off. Even though it is a good game, it's just it takes so long to get going, and by the time it gets going, I'm just like, I've had a fuck enough of this. <laughs> well, it's that's why I like help. four. That's why I like four. Four has much better pacing. Four just has a slow opening, but once you get past the opening, it fucking flies. It, it's about like what, like three hours? But then after that three hours, you're kind of coasting. Yeah, and, and, and it's only. It, and it's paced really well to where it's like you're in the game playing it for a good while. And then by the time you get to like a story moment or where there's a lot of like dialogue or whatever, it's like the right time to get a break. So you can just oh, yeah. kind of soak in the story. Like I feel like Persona 4 it does a good job of keeping you reeled in because there's just enough like action, talking, action, talking. You know, you have to pace it out. Whereas I think 5, maybe it does it later, but just my experience with it, it just takes so long to get to those points to get to the action because the action is so fucking good like i love the like the dungeon crawling and the combat system like that part of of it but the rest of it i just i don't know man like all the social aspect stuff feels like it goes on too long it feels like the map is too big that's but, that's the know. difference because inaba is so easy to travel because it's like four screens yeah um, yeah because it's a small town in the middle of nowhere which was great and then this is just like smack dab like suburban at, or smack dab like metro tokyo or whatever oh yeah fuck. so it's just there's a lot but eventually I, I i'll try it again okay i'll try it again mm. so look at that look at that artwork that's some that cool ass nice. artwork I, I like it more than the original persona 5 artwork yeah, the see, I have the steel book, so I've I've always had the preferred art. Yeah, in my opinion. and it, and it emphasizes her. She's the new character, right? and she's so not. She's such a nothing character too. But That's she's the the, but she's the brand new one. I wanted Shogi Girl to be the new character. Damn it! <laughs> you probably just wanted Yuki Go again. Well, Shogi Girl kind of has that same vibe. But um, yeah, of course, you fucking dick. <laughs> well, hey. <laughs> Yukiko's voice actress plays like the drunk reporter, and that's just like a fan theory that this is like the, the alternate universe where Yukiko left the inn, and now she's just some drunk <laughs> reporter. She she finally got to escape her fate. Well, you did, if, if you don't do her social link, you don't understand. You never she never gets that conclusion. And well, I, I yeah, I, I I didn't put a huge amount of time into Persona Four, but I know that I was doing well. I was doing the social links with everybody because you might as well, right? And with Yukiko. Mm -hmm. 
I just remember being bored shitless at the grocery store with her, but then she would occasionally talk about like her whole, the whole family business. And then I perked up. So I'm like, Ooh, this is something actually interesting. And then she talked about for a little bit and then give up. And I'd be like, fuck this fucking God damn it. Hers picks up around like link seven. That's when like she really her. She actually starts gaining independence. Good for her. Honestly, like that's like what I love about Persona games is the social links because like the more the farther you get through them, the, you actually see that the development happen. Yeah, yeah. Which is why when I eventually sit down and beat that game proper, I, I can't wait to see Risei's uh, whole line because I like Hers Risei. Is good. Risei is a cool character. I mean, I love every character in that game. They're, they're all really good. Yeah. Oh, well, Kanji's my favorite. He'll forever be Ka my favorite character. He's the Ka best. Ka Kanji's the Kanji's the the best kind of trope because he's such a softy. <laughs> he is the best. But speaking of Sega, did you see the uh, the trailer for the Like a Dragon Amazon series? Yeah, it doesn't look awful. I'm not. I it, when I saw it, I'm like, I don't think this is going to be any good. It's probably not going to be amazing, but it's like I've seen worse. It's kind of one of those things where I'm just like, yeah, we'll see. Yeah. I, I I don't know. It's just I don't know. Call me crazy. I feel like the guy they got to be Kiru doesn't look a thing like him. Yeah, you know, it's like yeah, you can put him in the jacket. You know, like Majima was better. They had a better pick for that. But I don't know. It just I just feel like the show, no matter what they do, it's not going to reach the heights of games. See, it's the, just the... it's just it, it like it can't even match it. So like, what the fuck's the point? Yeah, the thing the thing that sucks. I mean, it doesn't suck. It's awesome that it happened. But like the problem with any sort of live action adaption of like anything now is like it's going to be forever compared to the fucking One Piece live action, which just ended up being a smash hit. Yeah, I'm not even necessarily comparing it to that. I'm comparing it to its source material because like I see why they're like, oh, Yakuza would make sense as a live action thing. Like I I see it for sure. But you have to go in with like mixing the right amount of serious and silly. And I feel like the the trailer is way too serious. And yeah. uh, maybe the silly stuff is in the show. I don't know. Because, I mean, they, were, they even said, like, they didn't want every, like people to play the games while they were working on the show. Which I feel like that. But that's like, that's what you need. That's how you know what's going on. I mean, yeah, they're not going to have like a two episode arc where you're like sitting on a phone talking to like random like like the call center thing. Yeah. Right. Even though that would be amazing or, you know, they're not going to have like a whole season dedicated to Majima running the cabaret club, you know, which, again, would be amazing. But they're not going to do that, you know, and that's what makes the Like a Dragon series so good. We, we need to start. We need to ditch the Yakuza name and just start calling it Like a Dragon. Right. Uh, but like the Like a Dragon series. What's, what I've liked about the game so far is just, yeah, those wacky ass side stories and that they don't for the most part, don't take too much of your time, but they always leave an impression. And I just condensing all of that into a TV show, like it could work, but I just, I'm not confident in it working. I mean, you Yakuza's know? Yakuza zero is like the perfect example of just how like, of like side quests that just like go on, like the fucking, the guy trying to sell shrooms <laughs> the whole time. Yeah. I haven't gotten super far into zero, so I can't say, the one side story from that I remember is like that teenage girl who's selling her underwear. I remember that one. Yeah, that was. Yeah, that had a that was that was an interesting uh, arc. And that's a hero kind of getting roped band. into that. I yeah. know, I know, it's a thing. Um, it's pretty funny. But like Infinite Wealth had quite a few side stories that went on for way too long for a conclusion that was not that interesting. Yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> but. You know, it is. There were some good ones, but the good ones were all like callbacks to the older games. So, yeah. oh well, that pirate game is going to be awesome. I'm probably there for that one. Hmm. See, that's what they should do. They should take the Majima pirate game and make that a TV show. Like that, what? However insane that game is going to be, just make that a TV show, and you that probably be the best TV show ever made. Yeah. <laughs> so, and and the, and the good thing with the the like a dragon show and everything, and I think the like dragon series has done such a good job in the last few years of keeping consistent like releases. You know, like they're not taking forever to make these games, and then when they come out, people are happy with them generally. Like they found a really good formula of like, yeah, they're they're pumping them out, but at a decent rate, and overall the quality is still remaining like pretty high. 
You it's know, a decent and, rate, but there's also enough spacing in between that you don't get sick of it. Yeah, and, and now they're starting to do the thing where it's like, oh, we'll put like spin-offs, you know, like guide ends or kind of smaller games in between the big releases as well. Hmm. Which is which is smart because they did that between seven and eight. We got Man Who Erases Name, and now we're gonna get the pirate adventure. We may even get another one before we get nine. So hmm. who knows? Eventually I'll go back and play the other ones. So I, I do want to tackle Man Who Erased His Name since that's such a shorter one. I could just knock that one out. So I'm just glad that series is doing well, like overall. I find I finally became a fan. You know, it, it took people badgering me for fucking years to play these games. And now that I've played a hand a couple of them, you know, I'm like, yeah, I'm into them. I kind of want to see where these go. So mm. like I'll knock out Man Who Erased His Name and then I'll I'll, I'll tackle Zero again. It's just throw that combat on easy and just enjoy the show. Just enjoy yeah. the ride. <laughs> the freaking comedy that it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, I like Kiru. I love that. Like Kiru was trying to do noble things and yeah. everyone around him is just like, you fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I just love, like, I, recommending, like I love recommending Yakuza to anyone. Cause people are like, I don't know. That game looks scary. And I'm like, no, it's a fucking comedy. You'll enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like I'm like, I'm starting to do that now. To where, you know, people are like, you know, oh, like, oh, games are, you know, if like somebody's complaining about how games are these days, I'd be like, well, have you played the Like a Dragon Yakuza series? And if they go, no, I'm like, well, that series will solve all of your problems when it comes to like, you know, just wanting to like, you know, sink your teeth into like a, a, a big franchise that has a lot of like great content to give you. Like this series, man, like it's pretty crazy. I I'm surprised I know quite a few people who have like recently gone through the entire thing. And are just like head over heels for it now. Well, like once you start playing them, it's hard to put them down. Like you just kind of have to keep going. Yeah, yeah. But I, I'm pacing myself out because knowing me, if I go too hard, I'll burn out. Yeah. Well, especially once you get to three, because three is such a step back compared to the Kwame games. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kwame one and two were full on remakes, and and three is just a remaster of a PS3 game. So yeah, and three was kind of rough. Well, uh, PS3 game, I think. Yeah, I said that. Oh, I, PS3. I, I, yeah, they said two. Don't, I nah, don't no, no, no. Only uh, isn't it just Yakuza One is PS2, the original one? One and two. Or was, one and two. Okay. Three was the first one on PS3. That's why it's kind of rough. I tried playing a bit of the PS2 version of Yakuza One. What an oh, interesting, the, <laughs> what an interesting experience with the lovely dub that Mark Hamill doesn't even remember doing. I mean, I kind of like that dub. I do. Oh, it's, it's great. It's like classic awful Sega dubbing from like the late 2000s yeah very, very very dreamcast era type dub you know in fact that's crazy to think about in an alternate universe if sega were still making consoles the yakuza series would be like the ip that's selling that hardware it See, would like, be the yakuza dub like in yakuza one it reminds me a lot of like zero gx's dub like with like captain falcon he's like <laughs> where are you taking me <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> that's a great well that was also sega yeah, that's Sega made I that as well, so it's perfect. Yeah, I just remember like Nintendo never was amazing with voice acting around that period, but then you see F Zero GX, you're like, oh yeah, Sega made this one, all right. Oh yeah, yeah. It's, Sega's always never gave a fuck, and I love that. Yeah, <laughs> that's why I love Sega, man. So, uh, speaking of guys that never gave a fuck, though, uh, we do have a topic for this episode that isn't just about like a dragon. No. <laughs> uh, so we're doing another company retrospective like it's where we talk about companies that either had a big influence on 3do or were at least tangentially related to 3do yeah i'm so um, excited i'm so excited to talk about this record label yeah I know, right? <laughs> um so today we're talking about warp inc yeah um, warp, which... warp records man that's where apex twin was square pusher boards of canada they released albums from danny brown brian eno fucking death grips man it's uh, hilarious though. V, Brian, v's, you know, V's, v's tumor, you know, that's a that's a cool ass band. It's really funny though. Brian Eno, Benji Eno. Like, yeah, it is weird how that happened. Yeah. No, nah, but as much as it'd be fun for that these two warps to be the same thing, they're unfortunately <laughs> not. Yeah, we'll we'll talk about warp records when the music podcast eventually happens. Yeah. So, anyways, yeah, yeah, warp games or just warp, super warp, Phyto. What the hell is from, what, what are their from, name from yellow to orange 
that's not a big leap. <laughs> uh, this, it's just this, bleeding a little bit. <laughs> so it, despite what I initially thought, this company is still a thing. Like they technically are still open. Um, yeah. Yeah. Technically. Yeah. And the way that intelligent systems isn't technically owned by Nintendo. Yeah. <laughs> um, so warp was founded in 1994 by Kenji Eno, who is, He's a composer, but he's also a game dev. He He's a very interesting man in gaming history. He was very much known for being extremely unorthodox and generally not giving a fuck what the industry thought. Yeah, yeah. He, he's definitely one of those Japanese eccentric developers. You know, there's a whole host of them that uh, will probably do we'll probably mention them as we keep going and in and, and i think kenji you know represents like the like the real like radical side of those of those weirdos you know what i mean yeah because we we talked about it in some previous episodes because we've covered a few warp games on the show notably d and tripped um kenji you know would kind of like lie to <laughs> companies and then just immediately change their minds <laughs> just like swap things around just to get get his way like the uh, the infamous cannibal scene from uh, D. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a weird scene, man. I just love the. Th- it's so it's such a scummy thing, but it's kind of amusing that he got away with this, where he essentially just the rating board was like, you can't do that. So he's like, oh okay, okay, and makes a censored version, and then after he gets the okay, he just swaps it back with the original <laughs> and just, just sends it out to print. Yeah, I, I'm shocked he didn't get like in deep trouble over that. They probably, I guarantee you, they never checked. They probably just didn't care. It, it's amazing how many things get by the ratings boards. Yeah, it, it, it especially these days, you know, like so many games, they just slap the M on it. Oh, you yeah. know, and then you see it and you're like, I feel like this wouldn't have gotten an M like 10 years ago, even. But, you know, yeah, it, things change. And also, it's weird how some like if you think about it, there's not that many T-rated games anymore. No, there really isn't. It's like just about everything is M, and then and then E. Like that's basically like you get like your E-rated like Nintendo games or like indie games or whatever, and then you from there more, you get um, like your M-rated like Dark Souls clones and you know oh, yeah. like dra- like you're like a dragons or you know Most, or your uh, or your personas personas rated M. Oh yeah, of course. Oh, yeah. Jesus Christ. <laughs> fucking penis bosses in that game <laughs> um and murder yeah like just straight up murder ironically you see more e10 these days than t i think t is honestly yeah. just gonna become e10 in, in a way yeah I, i'd have to see what like modern i think visions of man is a t yeah it's weird like a lot of games that were m back in there like t now and a lot of like games that were t back in there like e10 now yeah well visions of man just came out that was the newest mana game. And yeah, that's that's a teen. So you see it occasionally, but not nearly as much as we uh, Oh, Star Wars Outlaws was T. Hmm. That surprises me. I thought that would have been an M. Uh, Astrobots and E10. So. Yeah, it's kind of all over the place. Yeah, but it's interesting to do. V- v- viewers, if you want to look, it's like you're if you have a collection of like modern games, be it Switch, PlayStation, Xbox, or whatever, just pull them out and look at the ratings and just kind of compare, like just see how many like you know games get like M, E, or T or whatever. And I think you'd be surprised. So going back to Warp, their their game library is very small, but it's also like one of the most all over the place like libraries I think I've ever seen. Yeah, it's one of the most like Japanese gameographies I've seen in in a long time. Like they started with Tripped, which we've covered in the past, is a very unique puzzle game that's kind of not the deepest, but it's it's fun for what it is. Yeah. Then they made, I'm gonna butcher this, Kotasuki Kiken Megadasu, also which... known as Russian Fire Megadeths. A, a banger name and i believe that was a 3do game as well it was a japan only one yes um, and looking at gameplay footage of it it is like a first person fighting game i think i think so 
like some weird like arena fighter thing in the first person and it is very weird it looks like tripped from an art style perspective yeah ba basically if the if the the pieces in trip got mad at each other and, and wanted to smash yeah i'm sure we'll cover it at some point but sure they also, that's <laughs> yeah they also made a game called uchu saibutsu flop flop on kun p um i think it's kun p kun p yeah um it was on playstation and it was a puzzle game as well oh no this is the sequel to that enhanced version of tripped yeah this just looks like tripped yeah but instead it has like the pieces like just looking at each other in a very like mean bean machine style, you know, where you have like the pieces right there as mm -hmm. you're playing. Cause I believe trip did not have that. No, it was definitely an updated version of tripped. Um, yeah. And it's, it, it looks like more tripped. Yep. And then after that, they're probably most iconic title, uh, D D Dre's Upstairs. favorite game. Yeah, <laughs> I feel bad because it, it hasn't aged well at all. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, Dre represents somebody who was like he was there at the time. And oh, so yeah. his praise of the game is more of like, you know, like, it, it, it's definitely a you had to be there kind of game. And I, and I totally get that. You know, I feel like if we played this in 95, it would have been very, very like, whoa, man, this is, this is wacky. Yeah. It's one of those games that I wish we I could have seen it back then, just so I would have had more of a appreciation for it. Because I get it why it was such a big thing, but like nowadays, there's just no reason to play that game anymore. Oh yeah, yeah. It's like you 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 watch it on YouTube and then you're good to go. Um, they also made oh yeah, Oyaji Hunter Mahjong. <laughs> I'm I'm struggling here, guys. Yeah, um, dude, you're the guy who like. You're the fucking weeb, and you can't pronounce these shits. Yeah, hey, I'm an, ex an exclusively a dub guy, so I'm, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not that bad. Yeah, I think it's Oyaji Hunter Mahjong, I believe, which again um, is also 3DO, and it's. I think it's just a goddamn Mahjong game. Yeah, we'll have to go kidnap Aaron again and play this one at some point. Um, I will say the screenshots. One of them has an anime schoolgirl holding her dress down in like a shock pose, which oh, lovely. No. Oh no! Um, say that it's not explicit, but it's very okay. Ka kawaii. Yeah, and it's not mahjong in the way of like oh, like the matching tiles. It's like mahjong that's like almost played as like a card game where you have the different mahjong and you play them. And 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 that's like I've never figured out how that works, and I probably never will. Yeah, this is definitely I, an, an Aaron game. If I couldn't figure this shit out and like like a dragon, there's oh, no Lord. way I'm going to figure this shit out here. And they try their best to explain it. The description like, for this game is is something. <laughs> the, something. The o Oyaji Hunter is on a mission to save cute girls from indecent men. What the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> the story is presented with animated cutscenes. The actual fights between the Oyahai hunter and his opponents take the form of mahjong matches. Oh my god! This game is made is very Japanese, and I understand why it didn't make the jump. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I, even now that would be a hard sell to bring over from Japan. I mean, I've seen worse, but that is that's that's a uh, that's a questionable one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they also made Flopon World, which I believe is just tripped again. It's just like a weird, like a more focused on puzzles version of tripped. I yeah. Think. Like which... it tries to have some variety. It's like, oh, here's like a shooting game or here's like a, you know, like a like a big giant uh, a board of tripped pieces that you have to try to get rid of them all. You know, that kind of stuff. It, it looks like it tries to have more of like a mini game variety thing for for tripped, which sure. Why not? Yeah, I mean it's it's Japan only, but I'm sure we'll cover it at some point, like most games. I mean, it um, might be something interesting. Yeah, it looks more interesting than Oyaji Hunter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they also did D D's Diner Director's Cut. The diner. What's the, what's the difference, or is it just an updated version? It's probably just an updated version. Ah, uh, it has new scenes and a visual novel documenting Laura's backstory. 
Just oh. what we want. <laughs> just Ooh, what we I really needed her backstory. But it's also only in Japan, so <laughs> that's great for us. That's amazing. Uh, they made a game called Short Warp. Which I think is like a compilation of their stuff or something. I'm like I'm like I'm having a hard time finding information on a lot of these games, but it was so with this one I get the sense it's almost like a showcase of everything that they've done up to this point. So it uh, Moby Games has been like the most reliable source for me on finding information on their games. Apparently it it so it is a collection of nine mini games, although not all of them are previously released because i see uh actually no i think they're all completely original to this collection oh great so it's just more mini games yeah so basically a waste of time yeah it's very on par um and then by this point they gave up on the 3do and they moved on to the uh saturn because they've sony pissed them off um <laughs> and we got enemy zero which is essentially the second D game. Yeah. Yeah. Kenji Eno getting mad at Sony. I feel like, I, I feel like that's not on Sony. So apparently what happened was they, uh, they failed to meet the expect the promises for, um, the number of copies of D made. Yeah. And it didn't sell as well because of that. And he blames Sony for that. So, yeah, apparently, let's see. He developed a ma maverick repu uh, reputation during his work with Warp and shocked the Japanese video game press in a dramatic 1996 press conference where he burned bridges with Sony by displaying a video depicting the PlayStation logo morphing into the logo for Sega Saturn to indicate that Warp's latest game meant Enemy Zero would be a Saturn exclusive. When we've mentioned before, he did not give a fuck. <laughs> like he Fur just Furthering this reputation, at that year's Tokyo Game Show, they displayed a video of themselves dancing and singing a song with lyrics roughly translated as Enemy Zero is a good game, Warp is a good company. At which Ito threw to the floor a plush doll of Mumu, the mascot of Sony's hit game Jumping Flash. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> the dude just did not give a shit. Man. Like Man, I, I kind of love it, but at the same time, what the fuck? <laughs> like, well, also, I think there is uh, some from from what I've read of his uh, Wikipedia page, I think there's a suggestion that he might not have been the most mentally stable man. No, considering the games he made, it, it, it would not surprise me. Yeah, so I've so I've heard Enemy Zero is actually a better D. Um, from a lot of people, but it is one of those Saturn games that's stupidly expensive, so I have yet to truly... Oh, you mean all of them? I mean, Bug's not that expensive. <laughs> um. <laughs> Thank God. It's, that masterpiece is still available. Yeah. Um, other than that, though, I think after after uh, Enemy Zero, he made quite possibly, I think, his most interesting game, just from a concept... And that was uh, Real Sound, Kazi No Regret. Yes, this is like the audio-only game. It is a purely audio experience. Like, it's an adventure game, but it's purely audio. I actually have it for the Saturn, and I've messed around with it. It is very confusing, because obviously it's a Japan-only game. But the idea intrigues me. Unfortunately, I don't think we'll ever truly experience anything like it in the future. Yeah, but probably I, not, and there's probably never been an English translation of this. No, well, I, I just don't think it's possible. Let's be honest. Yeah, you you you'd have to like re-record the entire game's like audio log. You know, you can't just replace the text. Yeah. So yeah, it would be it would be a lot of work. Like the only thing that I could compare it to maybe is the the Thousand Year of Dreams from Lost Odyssey, which has like kind of like an audio book. Uh, quality to those like short stories, you know what I mean? But I think this real sound is trying to do something more broad than that, I guess. Like, apparently, it was intended to provide equal access to sighted and blind players, but Kaze no regret means the wind's regret. So, that like, there's probably a decent story in here, but I've read the plot synopsis, it is interesting. Like it's apparently it's 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 centered around fear and love and it's a whole story that unfolds in Tokyo. It's interesting. I've read the synopsis. It's a lot. 
unfortunately, I don't think you'll be able to really truly experience it though without playing the game, which I'd like to learn Japanese at some point just to kind of experience some games like this. But for the meantime, it's one of those things that's just kind of going to be an interesting piece on my shelf. Yeah. I mean, there might be like a English like script out there somewhere. Maybe. I don't know. But, mm. you know, again, I feel like reading this game would probably not do it justice. Like you kind of have to play it. So, yeah. And then after real sound, we get another game of his that is, some people love it, but a lot of people despise this game. Uh, D2. See, see, people always hate on D2, but I feel like the, the Mighty Ducks sequel does a good job of <laughs> you know, maintaining the same quality as the original Mighty Ducks. It's really, it's, really the, it's really D3 that like isn't as good. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Movie. Oh, yeah. The game. Oh, yeah. The game D2. Yeah. I, I, I watched the intro on emulator and was uh, baffled by the entire experience. It is just as obtuse as the first D, but it's trying to be like an actual game this time yes. around. Yeah, you can tell that Resident Evil and Silent Hill had uh, come out, and uh, he was trying to, I think, uh, take a little bit of that as far as like gameplay was concerned. I also love the fact that he renamed the company Super Warp for this game. Because <laughs> it's a super game. Well, it, speaking, it's of, speaking of Sega, super game. Yeah, what's funny though is Super Warp's uh, tagline was "We guarantee you a smile." <laughs> and, and this one, game is not yeah. a happy game at all. No, but I also love the fact that Super Warp's logo has like two like they're supposed to be faces looking at each other, but because of the way it's drawn, they're just like these blank stares. Like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I just... see, see, I didn't think it was two faces. I just thought it was like a weird like. I dot thing. But see, now that's what I, I see it. Yeah, that's what I thought at first. But then I I read the we guarantee you a smile, and I kind of looked at it for a minute. I'm like, wait a minute, like this doesn't work at all. No, it, it's the oh, what the fuck was it from? It, it was like a PBS thing where they had like the two shadowy faces, you know, and it was like duh, uck, duck, like that. It looks like that, but the Japanese version of it. So I'm sure there's a listener who knows exactly what I'm talking about, but I don't remember the name of it we'll probably get into it more when we eventually cover d2 on the oh, show yeah. but oh, apparently yeah. d2's backstory like development history is really fucking interesting because originally it was supposed to be a game on the for m2. the on the m2 and it had a completely different storyline and like basically it was a different game entirely yeah um, I, would, I would have loved to have seen again i would have loved if the m2 came out because goddamn the stuff we would have got on that thing and probably like the weird alternate history we would have where it's like, Oh, this console that has like the sequel to return fire on it in D two and clay fighter three. And like, like a weird backyard NFL football game. And like actually a couple RPGs, the um, army men, and the army men series. And, and, and sure the army men series. Gone. Well, the original army men was, uh, it was started on the M two before it moved to PC. So yeah. And then after that, then they they disappeared for 10 years um i mean they, they peaked they peaked they couldn't yeah. go on they changed their name from super warp to from yellow to orange and they released a game <laughs> called you me and the cubes if you're going from yellow to orange you need to drink more water my guy <laughs> uh y yes you do what i love too is that <laughs> moby games doesn't even include uh this era because they consider it a different company even though it is literally the same company yeah yeah and and i never heard of this game prior to it um i'm looking at some gameplay footage of it right now and yeah it's like there are these two characters on these like little cubes and i guess you use the wiimote to like tilt it around or something like i'm not yeah. quite sure i'm not quite sure what the goal of the game is it like, i think it's meant like... to be like a puzzle game yeah, that's that's kind of what it looks like. It looks like kind of like one of those puzzle games you'd find on like Switch Store nowadays or Steam. Yeah, it, or yeah, it, it feels like a game that was definitely made in that era of like like the PSP puzzle game because there's a few PSP puzzle games that are trying to be something like kind of weird and different. And I feel I just, like this game is kind of in that vein, but it's trying to actually like take advantage of like the Wii functionality in it, you know. Yeah, there's like this image of like these two like 
anime-ish character 3D models like boxing each other on top of one of the cubes. It looks like I, this is just an interpretation. I'm not actually sure what's going on here. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm not quite sure either. Let's see. Let's Did this see. game even come out in America? It doesn't say. I don't see why it wouldn't. It's unclear. But, but let's see. Uh, it's one of the last games. Yeah, the game involves uh, Phallos, which are a race of little people that you have to place on 3D cubes. They have to be placed in pairs, and the object of the game is to keep the cube balanced so that they don't fall off. Sounds simple, and it is, but each round adds extra cubes, and soon you have a strange 3D objects uh, made up of multiple cubes. Each requiring it has one Phallos on to clear the round. I hate the name that they're called Phallos. That's... That yeah, just sounds fa- bad. Phallos, 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 yeah. So, so I, yeah. So I think the idea is, yeah, that you're trying to, um, yeah, keep the cube balanced with these like two characters, and they just make the cubes more and more complex, so that you know their gravity is kind of messed up. Like it's an interesting idea for a game, you know. Like if if it was, I mean, I'm sure it's playable if I look hard enough, but. And after that. Um... Eno actually uh, passed away in 2013. Yes. Um, his final project was a game called uh, Akeksun, I think, which was then later a collaborative element between From Yellow to Orange and a completely unrelated company called Warp 2. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, and apparently the um, they did release an audiobook version of Real Sound at one point so because apparently uh from yellow to orange now mostly just distributes music like they're not even really a game company anymore yeah which makes sense because uh Eno was you know much like the other Eno, he was a yeah he was a musician and did a lot of electronic music and even composed mm-hmm. some music for the games that you worked on as well he so. did he actually his his co- composition uh discography is a little interesting he actually did a some of the music on Sega Rally 2, of all things, which is kind of cool, I guess. That's, yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, it's like one of his only non M games that he actually worked on. Oh, he did Casino Kid, too. That's cool. Oh, th- thank God. Um, apparently, he worked on a remix album for the band The Cinematic Orchestra, which I imagine most of our audience does not know who The Cinematic Orchestra is. They're like an electronic, modern, classical, new jazz type of uh, group. Um, and they're pretty good. I've listened to a handful of their records. Um, let's see, like, yeah, like Motion was pretty good. Every Every Day is the one I think people tend to go for. The Floor, I was all, like, To Believe was their most recent record. I quite liked that. Um, even their soundtrack albums are, are, are pretty good as well. So they're they're an interesting band to, to, to check out. So, yeah, I, I would recommend uh, the Every Day record from 2002. If, if you're curious enough to a band called the Cinematic Orchestra. But yeah, he did a remix or a reinterpretation of their song, The Fear Theme. So, which is pretty cool. Hmm. Yeah, he seemed like a very interesting guy. I I loved his no shits given attitude, to be honest. Yeah. I don't think someone like him would would be able to exist in the gaming world these days. Um, Just because it's so uptight now, but just kind of... It's that Sony story is still the funniest thing ever. I mean, yeah, the industry has gotten up tight, but there are still like weird eccentric dudes, you know, oh, yeah. still making I mean, games in the industry. I mean, we have Kojima, we have um, uh, Yoko Taro, we have uh, Suda still doing stuff. We even have Peter Molyneux still making shit. Yeah. Like, you know, we like we've got some like, you know, still some weirdos, you know, out there in the um, in the video gaming world. But you know, it's not nearly as many, and you could argue no. that the and you could argue that these guys um, were kind of like grandfathered in because they've been yeah. around for so long. Because when I think of like eccentric like game devs nowadays, I'll think of like fucking like Phil Fish and his fucking like <laughs> melt, 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 meltdown, um, Fuck or that, the dude. the freaking uh, Flappy Bird dev who had a freaking also had a <laughs> meltdown. Well, I feel bad for that guy. The, the Angry Bird, or not the Angry Bird, the Flappy Bird guy, because like... That I game think ruined it, his life, apparently. Well, yeah, because I think it became way bigger than he ever expected it to be, and you just didn't know how to handle it. So that's why yeah. he kind of abandoned it. And now that it's like, 
when it's like, oh, it's back. And everyone went, oh, that's cool that it's back. But then we found out like it like the guy who made it, like he doesn't even own the game anymore. It's been bought by some like shitty like NFT company who's trying to like yeah. like t- take this game and probably try to make a bunch of money with it. And he doesn't endorse it at all. Um, so my my guess is that version probably won't do very well. No, well, I mean, it's it's a shit. It was kind of a shit game, anyways, that people played just because it was kind of a meme for a bit. Yeah, I mean, I we all played it when it came out. I remember. I remember getting frustrated and be like, "This is stupid," and then just not <laughs> playing it anymore. So I think what year did that game come out? Was it twenty twelve? Yeah, that was that was like right at the end of high school for me because I remember like everyone yep. was playing. I, you'd be sitting in class and you just hear the fucking like flapping Ding. sound. Yeah, yeah, in yeah, the background. yeah. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, I remember as well, because that was like right around the time I think I got like I think it was when I got my like one iPhone and I and I had Flappy Bird on it and I played it because it was just something to do. Um, and, and, it, and it was fun to try to see like how far people could get in that game. I think I think the best I ever got was like 30 something, which is yeah. like, not bad, but, you know, it, it was definitely one of those games that you could easily get frustrated playing, though. Yeah, because its controls are very finicky, but, you know. But uh, yeah, that was Warp, a very interesting company from back in the day. Oh yeah, um, what what an interesting dev, what an interesting man. That that mahjong that mahjong game actually kind of threw me off because I'm <laughs> like, at first I was like, oh, this could be a fun game to cover, and then I read more into it. I'm like, I'm not sure if I want to even play this now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're probably not going to do that one. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. I'll see how bad it actually is. <laughs> you're you're going to do the research. Yeah, I'll see if it's like actually bad or if it's just haha Japan bad. So well, it's like 50 50. <laughs> <laughs> it's about as good as you can get. Yeah. Like it's either it's played for laps or it's actually uncomfortable. There's like, yeah, no yeah. Between. For sure. For sure. So, but on that note, I think next week we were going to play the Sherlock Holmes game. Yes. Lost files of Sherlock Holmes. I've got it all ready to go. I got so, the emulator set up, so because I uh, money was kind of a, I won't get into it. Money, I had some issues last week, but uh, that's besides the point. It's um, all good, man. It's all good, man. But yeah, but yeah. Since next week, I will be uh, uh, spending most of my time in uh, Virginia because uh, my my brother's getting married and he's forcing all of us to go down there. Um, I I will be gone next week, um, though. I think we'll still do the 3DO episode, but it's probably going to be delayed. Um, and well, I'm not we recorded sh- Monday. We should be good. Yeah, we'll probably record it early, so it'll come out at the same time. And then probably that probably that week I come back, we'll see where we're at because I probably won't yeah. have any time to like play through do stuff while I'm there. Um, yeah, worst but, comes but, to worst, we'll just do a chat episode and just yeah, I, I can talk about my experience because I I have a bad feeling it's gonna be weird, but we'll, we'll get to that as we go. And yeah, and then and I will be streaming this thursday um i have a a slightly different idea for for this week's stream so just tune in for that but obviously yeah on the third but obviously on the 10th i will not be streaming since i will be away so just keep you all aware but i'm, I'm gonna try to do something a little little different this this thursday i have i have an idea that i feel like i'm gonna fucking hate but <laughs> it'll be good content nice but um yeah, so anyways, guys, once again, thank you for joining us on the 3DO Experience. The 3DO Experience can be found on all the major podcasting platforms, particularly Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Um, and be sure to check us out over on superpodnetwork.com. Uh, you can find a whole bunch of awesome like shows, videos, uh, blogs, and a bunch of our fellow creators like Superpod Saga, Super Ghost Radio, Retro Rehab, Tommy's Video Game Ride Along, A Novel Console, Bar Silence, Fine Time, The Elder Trolls Gaming Podcast, Remember 64, Gaming Together, Friday Night Gamecast, and of course, the three GNC shows, Gaming and Collecting, the 3DO Experience, and Geek Addicts. And with that, everybody, be sure to check out Thrax Stream on Thursday. Link's down below, and uh, the Twitch link is there. And with that, we will see you all later. Bye-bye.